Throughout the history of Canada, certain events are always highlighted and are well enshrined in our collective memory. Be it the War of 1812, the Battle of Vimy Ridge, the creation of Canada in 1867, or the 1972 Summit Series. However, there is so much more to our history and the history of the land before Canada existed. This podcast endeavors to tell those stories, looking at chapters of our history that may be regionally well-known, but not necessarily well-known nationwide. Each Wednesday, we will bring you more about our country, looking to some of the more macabre tales, looking at the legends, mysteries, and more. And while much of the podcast that airs every Sunday is rooted in solid fact, the stories we tell on Wednesdays will more than likely leave more questions than answers. Welcome to Canadian History After Dark. A manhunt that lasted more than a month and covered 240 kilometers through the Northwest Territories and Yukon. And even though the suspect was killed in a shootout with the RCMP on the Eagle River, no one really is sure who he actually was. It is a story that has gripped imaginations, has been retold in various ways on film, and through music. This is the story of the Mad Trapper of Rat River. We need to start back at the very beginning, when the Mad Trapper arrived in northern Canada. The tale goes back to July of 1931. Albert Johnson arrived in Fort McPherson, a hamlet in the Northwest Territories. It is south of Inuvik along the Peel River. Over the course of 10 days, the stranger bought roughly $1,400 in supplies. Now this is $1,400 in 1931. Said he was going to be setting up an outfit near the Rat River. The amount of money he was carrying was unusual and attracted the attention of the town's factor, Bill Douglas. Johnson was described a man who looked as though he had been living alone in the wilderness for months. Yet his plans seemed to indicate he didn't have strong bushcraft. Shortly after the arrival of Johnson, Constable Edgar Millen of the RCMP arrived in town as part of his regular patrol through the community. Millen was pointed in the direction of Johnson, and the two men had a conversation. The subject of the conversation was recounted in an article by Alan Phillips in McLean's magazine in October of 1955. Quote, Millen found Johnson down on the steamboat landing, assembling his gear. The Mountie introduced himself. Johnson shook hands reluctantly. Anything I can do for you? Millen asked. No, no, Johnson said hurriedly. I'm just pulling out. From his accent, Millen tabbed him as a Swede from the northern states. He had an upturned nose and a broad, flat face, and his features were curiously stiff, as if he were constantly struggling with the hostility that came seeping to the surface from some inner reservoir. How do you come in? Millen asked. Mackenzie River. I had been working all last winter on the prairies. Millen knew it was a lie. Douglas had told him the stranger had come from upriver. He let it pass. Going to stay around here long? Millen asked. Maybe. I don't know yet. If you want the trap, I can give you a license now that will save you making a trip into Arctic Red River. I haven't made up my mind, Johnson said evasively. I may go over Rat River Portage. Alone? Johnson scowled. He made no answer. You want to hire a guide, Millen said evenly. It was as if the thought had triggered some mental thermostat. Anger flooded into Johnson's voice. No, he said violently. I don't want people bothering me. I like to live alone. You please just cause me trouble. I don't want nothing to do with you. He recovered himself and a hint of shrewdness came into his voice. You want to know all about me? All right, I'm not staying here. If I'm not staying here, you don't have to know all about me, eh? He met Millen's suddenly sharpened gaze for the first time. Millen had been trying to tell him that one man alone could not make his way up Rat Rapids. But Johnson's blue eyes, pale as sea ice, were filled with cold, unreasoning hate. Unquote. Taking a nine-foot canoe he had purchased in Fort McPherson, Johnson set off towards the Mackenzie Delta. He would end up at the mouth of the Rat Canyon, where he built a cabin for the winter. Now, it is worth noting that Johnson never did take up Millen on the trapping license, 
and had never ventured to the RCMP detachment in Aklavik to get one. Another issue that was happening in the region was people fleeing the Great Depression. They were heading north and invading traditional trapping areas of the Gwich'in in the area. By December of 1931, the indigenous people of the area had had enough of Johnson. While heading to Aklavik for Christmas celebrations, they took the time to report the behavior of Johnson to the RCMP. They explained the strange hermit was triggering their traps, taking the traps and putting them in trees, and in some cases, replacing their traps with his own. When the indigenous trappers went to the cabin of Johnson's to have a chat about the situation, he chased them off with a gun. The complaint was taken, and on December 26th, two constables, Alfred King and Special Constable Joe Bernard, headed off to cover the 70 kilometers to talk with Johnson about the allegations. When the two Mounties arrived at the cabin, they saw that smoke was coming from the chimney, so it was apparent someone was home. They went, knocked on the door, and were ignored. Looking into the window, it seemed like Johnson wasn't even taking notice of them. Eventually, he just covered the window with a sack. One thing King noticed was that there were what appeared to be rifle loopholes along every wall of the cabin, all pointing outwards, covering every direction. The decision was made to return to Aklavik to talk to the inspector in charge, A.N. Eames, about obtaining a search warrant. The 70-kilometer trek back had King and Bernard arriving on December 31st. The situation was described to Eames, and he issued the warrant. And he sent back with the two Constable R.G. McDowell and Lazarus Sidichulius, a Gwich'in man who worked with the RCMP. They set back out for the mouth of the Rat Canyon. The situation for the serving of the warrant, as described by Phillips. Quote, King was impatient to finish this business in time to get to Bill Douglas's New Year's party being held at Fort McPherson. You stay with the dogs, Joe, he told Bernard. Lazarus, you scout around to the back. Jack, you cover me, will you? McDowell edged behind a riverbank spruce. King strode toward the cabin. The wind was rising, whipping away the smoke that was still coming from the chimney. He hammered hard on the door. Are you there, Mr. Johnson? He thought he heard movement inside. Mr. Johnson, he called again, testing the door with his shoulder. I have a search warrant. Open up or I'll have to break the door down. There was no answer. Again, he bunted the door. It gave a little. Then he felt himself hurled to the snow by a smashing blow in the chest. He heard a shot. It seemed to come from very far away. Bullets began splintering through the door and went whining overhead. He heard McDowell calling, King, can you crawl? Crawl away from the cabin. Make for the brush. McDowell would fire on the cabin while Sidichulius helped King down the bank and got to work bandaging his wound in the freezing cold. They strapped him to a toboggan and they raced the dog sleds back to Aklavik, where King was taken to the hospital. Unquote. He was lucky to have survived the bullet missing vital organs by less than an inch. The news of the shooting of the officer raced through the town of 200. Eames called for a posse to be rounded up to head back to the cabin. He would have seven men with him, McDowell, Sidichulis, Bernard Millen, and three trappers who volunteered, Ernest Sutherland, Carl Gardland, and Knud Lang. In addition to the men and their firearms, they also brought along explosives. The thought process was if they couldn't get Johnson out conventionally, they would blast him out of the cabin come fortress. They arrived and surrounded the cabin. Eames tried diplomacy to solve the situation, calling out Johnson. No answer came back. They inched closer to the cabin, and then they got their reply. Muzzle flashes erupted from the loopholes as Johnson started to fire on the Mounties and the trappers. They threw a few charges of the dynamite at the cabin, and it had no effect. Daylight had dwindled. Then one of the trappers came up with a plan. He proposed it to Eames, who agreed. Phillips described the scene again. Quote, Running a gauntlet of fire, Lang made the roof, scrambled up, lit the fuse, flattened out for the blast, then kneeled and peered down the jagged hole. Through a swirl of acrid smoke, he saw Johnson crouching on the floor, a sawed-off shotgun in one hand, a revolver in the other. The two men stared into each other's eyes. Then Johnson snapped a shot. Lang jumped back and dodged to the riverbank. He knew now that Johnson had a shotgun, a revolver, 
and two rifles, probably a 22 and a 30-30 Savage, unquote. The Mounties threw flares. In the flickering light, they tried to glib Johnson between logs where the chinking had been blasted out by dynamite. But Johnson stayed out of sight. Eames had the posse fake a rush while Millen moved stealthily in. The crunch of his snowshoes gave him away, and Johnson's guns forced him back. Further gunshots from remains of the cabin drove the Mounties back to the banks of the Rat River. Suffering from frostbite and needing rest and food, the men chose to return to Aklavik, where Eames could arrange for more men as well as supplies. At Aklavik, the radio station alerted all trappers of the situation. Meanwhile, in the rest of Canada, newspapers were running headlines about the mad trapper of Rat River. This was the beginning of the meth that remains part of the collective memory of the country to this day. Eames no longer thought of Johnson as a hermit who had gone bush crazy. He thought him to be a fugitive of some sort. Only someone fleeing the law would ever put up such a fight against law enforcement. Another posse would be collected in Aklavik, with Constable Millen and Carl Gardland heading back to the cabin as a scouting party on January 15th. When they arrived at the cabin, they surveyed the debris and the construction of the building. The floor was actually comprised of holes in the ground, allowing for easy access to the loopholes. There was no sign of any furs, just empty casings from the gunfight. This wasn't the cabin of a trapper. This was a fortress designed to protect against a shootout. The rest of the group arrived two days later. It was determined that without any dogs, and in the current weather conditions, Johnson would not have gotten very far. They figured that he would be hiding in the brush somewhere in the canyon, so they began to search for him. And they searched for four days nothing was found. To preserve supplies, all but four of the men headed back to Aklavik. Millen, Gardland, Trapper, Noel Verville, and Army Signal Sergeant Frank Riddell stayed on the hunt with nine days' worth of supplies. Then they picked up his trail in the deep snow. They followed it, but it would cut across a ridge and disappear, only to be picked up again further down the river. It appeared Johnson was traveling along the ice, so he wouldn't leave tracks as often as he could. But where was he sleeping? Why weren't they finding any remains of the fire he would inevitably need to survive in the freezing cold of the Arctic? They did figure out where he was heading, though. Alaska. Johnson was on a course for the mountains, beyond which he would have just a short trek to cross into the United States, where the Mounties would not be able to pursue him. On January 28th, the trail was picked up again, and Johnson was found by the faint smoke in the distance from a fire he had set. Two of the men of the posse, Verville and Riddell, found what appeared to be Johnson's campsite. There was a fire, with no trails leading out of the thicket it was set up in. There were little trails coming from the fire, though. Two men went back to get Millen, the only sworn officer, to determine what course of action they would take next. Phillips described the next sequence of events. Quote, next morning, the four men peered from the lip of the gorge on a smoldering fire. Johnson was not in sight. He must be sleeping, Riddell said. I wonder why the trail behind those roots. I don't like it, Millen muttered, strangely preoccupied. The others glanced at each other. Millen was a man who took risk lightly. His greatest fault was his sense of personal invulnerability. The mood passed. Frank, Millen said to Riddell, you and Carl circle the ridge, get down in those willows, just behind them there on the creek bank. As soon as Noel and I see your set, we'll slide down in front. To their left, the sheer drop eased off into a slope. If he comes out and starts shooting at us, you guys pick him off. If he doesn't lift his gun, you won't get hurt. From the screen of willows, Riddell and Gardland stared down their gun barrels at the tiny campsite only 20 yards away. They heard the Mountie and Verville come crashing down the slope, breaking bushes, talking loudly. They caught a blurred glimpse of Johnson as he flung himself into the snow trench that lay behind the roots of the upturned spruce. Too late to warn Millen, they realized that the gravel-matted roots formed a natural barricade. Johnson had picked his second battleground. Unquote. Millen called out for Johnson to surrender, but there was no reply except for his rifle. A firefight erupted. 
Millen would be shot, hit in the chest. He was killed instantly. The three remaining men pulled him back and took cover. Johnson was just yards away, but didn't do anything further. The next morning, Riddell returned to Aklovic with Gardland and Verville staying to watch Johnson. Back in Aklovic, the RCMP stepped up the manhunt. Knowing that Johnson was heading west towards the thin panhandle of Yukon en route to Alaska, the only two passes over the Richardson Mountains would be blocked by the RCMP. Eames would put out a call for an airplane to help them in the hunt, and Wilfred Wap May answered the call, flying a ski-equipped monoplane. The posse grew in size as well, with men hearing the news over the radio and coming to Aklovic to help. This included a number of Inuvialut and Gwichin, who knew the country well. By February 4th, the posse was back at the scene of Millen's death, where Eames learned Johnson had managed to slip away from the scene. The only tracks he left was when he had walked over to where Millen's body lay. The methods that Johnson used to evade search were ingenious. They included following the footsteps of caribou. He would also do things like putting his snowshoes on backwards or doubling back a few times. He was determined to make it to these mountains. May would arrive on February 5th to help with the search. He would fly looking for any trace of the man who had now shot two Mounties, killing one. On February 11th, the pilot found the tracks of Johnson, heading towards Bell Pass. Now, to put this situation into perspective, the indigenous trappers who were helping with the posse told Eames it was not possible for someone to cross the Richardson Mountains alone, on foot, in a storm. Johnson was also walking into the wind, had next to no food, no way to start a fire, and above the tree line, there wouldn't be any food or wood. On the 12th, word came to Eames from Constable W.S. May, who was stationed at Old Crow, near the border with Alaska. Indigenous hunters had found strange tracks made by snowshoes with a twist to one frame. It looked like the person who had made them was exhausted, but it would prove that Johnson had accomplished what was thought to be impossible. He crossed the mountains. May helped the men fly over the mountain range on the 13th, and the search would begin again along the Bell River, where the tracks had been found. The search would continue, with Johnson having roughly a four-day head start. On the 15th, they picked up the trail and spread out along the Eagle River. Then signalman Hepps Hersey saw a man walking towards him. We go back to Phillips for his description of what happened. Quote, both men stopped, astonished. Johnson drew on snowshoes and ran to one side out of sight. Hersey snatched his rifle from his toboggan and rushed forward for a clear view. Johnson was trying to climb the steep south bank, trying to make the shelter of the brush. Hersey dropped to one knee and fired. Verville fired from behind him. Johnson whirled and snapped a shot. Hersey toppled over. Verville ran to Hersey's side. The others were coming up now, spreading out along the banks, passing back the word to Eames and Riddell in the far rear. It's Johnson. Johnson's up ahead. Johnson, unable to climb the south bank, was running back up his trail toward an easier slope on the north bank, stopping the fire, reloading as he ran. He was drawing away from the posse who were shooting and calling, surrender, when he stumbled as if hit in the leg. He wriggled out of his pack, flattened out in the snow behind it, and opened rapid fire. All around him now was the posse working into position. They stared through their gun sights at him from the deep snow of mid-river, from the thick brush of the banks alongside and above him. Johnson, Eames called out. This is your last chance to give up. Eames's voice rolled emptily out across the frozen white stream. A trapper shifted position and Johnson fired. Grimly, the posse poured out a volley. Johnson squirmed as the bullet struck. At ten past twelve, he was still. One spot of black in a white waste of snow. Unquote. Hersey was flown out by May for medical treatment. The remaining men looked at the man who had captured international attention while he ran from the Mounties through the Arctic. After weeks on the run with little to no rations, Johnson was severely emaciated. They searched his pack. They found a razor, comb, mirror, needle, thread, an oily rag, fish hooks, 
wax, matches, nails, axes, compass, 119 bullets, a knife, five freshwater pearls, some gold dust, $2,410 in cash, and two pieces of gold bridge work, which were not Johnson's. Then the mystery deepened. Who was Albert Johnson? It is a question that still hasn't been positively answered to this date, although technology has narrowed down who it could be quite a bit. The fingerprints and photographs of Johnson were sent to federal police in the United States, in Washington, across the Atlantic, to London, as well as to Sweden, as there was thoughts that he could be from that area. His weapons were traced, but nothing came back. There are a number of theories as to his identity. A man who called himself Arthur Nelson was trapping in British Columbia, and then he vanished. Shortly after, Albert Johnson appeared, and his description matched Nelson's. Nothing else was known about Nelson, though, other than he claimed to be a Swedish-American from North Dakota. Another theory put forward was that Albert Johnson, Arthur Nelson, and John Johnson, a man who did time in San Quentin Prison and Folsom Prison in the United States, were all the same person. DNA tests, though, have now proven that theory to be false. A forensic team in 2007 then delved into the case for the documentary film The Hunt for the Mad Trapper. An isotopic analysis of his teeth suggested he may have grown up in Scandinavia. The team also determined he had scoliosis, was roughly 35 years old, and was struck multiple times during the final firefight. His dental work was also top-notch, suggesting it had been done in a place like Chicago or New York. Further DNA analysis performed in 2021 has linked Johnson to multiple descendants of two people in Sweden. His genetic matches traced an ancestry to three towns in Sweden, but whoever he was is yet to be determined. When one looks at the whole case, the sheer tenacity of Johnson is one that leaves people in awe. He managed to cover a large distance without any assistance and with limited food. He scaled a mountain and crossed a range that the indigenous people of the area said had never been done by a person on their own. It was always done in a group or with assistance from dog sleds. How was Johnson able to do all of this? And what was he running from? Eames noted that his actions weren't those of a crazy hermit. They were those of someone who was very angry and who thought someone was out to get him. What possessed Johnson to build a cabin that was more like a blockhouse than anything else? Why did he have all that cash? Where did he get all of that cash? The story of Albert Johnson is one that leaves more questions than answers. But as the work continues on the DNA analysis, we may soon know who this man was and what his story was. We'll be back again next week with another story from the mysterious side of Canada's history. And this coming Sunday, we continue our look at the War of 1812 with our episode about the Battle of York, as well as the Battle of Stony Creek. You can look for us on Patreon. Join our community, where you can get early ad-free access to our podcast, and you'll also get access to our weekly live discussions on the history of Canada. Like and follow us on social media. This includes Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Every day we bring you our This Date in History feature, plus a lot more. Check out our YouTube and become a subscriber. We will be bringing more and more video content in the coming weeks. Speaking of video content, we're also working on a Kickstarter for our documentary series that tells the stories of Canada that are better told visually rather than just by audio. You can follow along the podcast on your favorite platform. We bring two episodes a week, Wednesdays, stories from the mysterious parts of our past, and Sundays, we take a deeper dive into a running anthology. Right now, we are focusing on the War of 1812. Be sure to visit our website, canadianhistorypodcast.ca, where you can find more on all of the subjects that we cover, both in our This Date in History feature 
as well as the podcast. Thank you for listening to Canadian History After Dark.